Here are a few of the things that he taught. He says, now in our modern scientific age, in a manner never known before, we have created our own sacred story, the epic of evolution. The epic of evolution. Notice, instead of the fundamentalists who want to run from evolution and tell us that, that as I heard one interviewed on BBC a few years ago, he was asked, well, how is it possible if the Earth is 6,000 years old that we found a dinosaur egg that's several million years old? And the fellow responded, God is testing me, testing my faith by planting an egg that looks like it's several million years old. That's pretty strange. <laughs> That's not the Christianity I was raised in. It's not the Christianity that is sustainable. Instead, we have Thomas Berry saying, our own sacred story, the epic of evolution, it's a beautiful phrase, telling us from empirical observation and critical analysis how the universe came to be, the sequence of its transformations down through some billions of years, how our solar system came into being, then how the earth took shape and brought us into existence. This is our sacred story. So Thomas Berry has done his homework from the point of view of science, as well as from the point of view of studying world religions, from Buddhism to the indigenous cultures, um, and has learned indigenous languages as well. And he comes to the conclusion that we have an epic, a new epic, a new sacred story that in fact transcends all our cultures. It does not mean you have to throw out the creation stories in the Bible or the creation stories from indigenous tribes or anything else. It's just that we can add this new story, which in fact is more universal because uh, science uh, has uh, transcended the globe. In another place he says, we will recover our sense of wonder and our sense of the sacred only if we appreciate the universe beyond ourselves as a revelatory experience of that numinous presence whence all things come into being. The numinous presence whence all things come into being. Indeed, the universe is the primary sacred reality. We become sacred by our participation in this more sublime dimension of the world all around us. And he takes on the, um, the, the battle between those materialistic scientists who talk about we're just here by random, uh, random collection of atoms, we're nothing but a random collection of atoms, and it's all determined. He, he, he takes on that battle when he says the evolutionary process is neither random nor determined, but creative creative. It follows a general pattern of all creativity, he writes. With this understanding, it would be difficult to overemphasize the magnificence of an evolutionary doctrine. It provides grandeur in our view of the universe and our human role in it that is so overwhelming, so overwhelming. <clears throat> and finally, he says, the human venture depends absolutely on this quality of awe and reverence and joy in the earth and all that lives and grows upon the earth. In the end, the universe can only be explained in terms of celebration. It is all an exuberant expression of existence itself. With his brother Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century, said that sheer joy is God's and this demands in other words, the basis for all of creation is joy, the divine joy shared. Who wants to have joy alone? Even God was lonely to share the sheer divine joy, and that's why there's a universe. Now, Barry also, also teaches ecology is functional cosmology, and so this, this basis of seeing the universe itself as sacred is, is, comes home locally in terms of the issues of how we're treating the land, the soil, the waters, the forests, the birds, the animals, and our own bodies, and our own bodies. If we're not treating our bodies well, if we're stuffing our bodies with chemicals and sugar and fat and so forth that do them injustice, then no wonder we're projecting this on the other bodies on the planet as well. And so this is a first step in 
not really reinventing Christianity as so much as getting back to its authentic meaning because of divinity itself took on flesh as it always does, which is a basic lesson in Christianity, then it means that this flesh should be reverenced. It should be treated with reverence, respect, in all of its forms, in all of its forms, rocks and soil, trees and whales, polar bears and humans. There is a wonderful statement from the indigenous people of Central America that says simply this, to be human. But that's what we have to get back to as human beings today and as Christians. We should back up. What does it mean to be human? To be human, one must make room in one's heart for the wonders of the universe. That is an ancient teaching from the indigenous people of these lands. To be human, one must make room in one's heart for the wonders of the universe. This is exactly what Thomas Berry is teaching. And uh, this is the first step in reinventing our faith life. <clears throat> A second step is to recover the balance of yin and yang of the masculine and the feminine. There could be no doubt that the yang energy, the fire energy, the masculine energy, it is out of control today. Take the BP spill in the Gulf this summer. What was that about, archetypally speaking? Well, we humans are so hungry today to get more energy to run our machines hotter and faster, whether we're talking about cars or airplanes or industry or what have you, that we'll go any place. We'll dig a mile deep in a gulf to get a little more oil. Thing is, we weren't smart enough to also have, with the knowledge of going deep, the wisdom of asking, oh, and what if we make a mistake? What should our steps be? That was not covered very well by BP. But notice what happened then. There was a mistake made. And so, of course, Mother Waters, La Mer, the sea, the yin, was damaged profoundly by the yang. The yang was out of control. It's all about knowledge and not wisdom. And, of course, all the living creatures in the Gulf were profoundly affected. Now they're just discovering what's done to the coral reefs there. Terrible stuff. And of course, also, human beings were affected, their livelihoods were taken away, etc., etc. It's, it's, a, it's a prime metaphor for the unbalance of yang and yin energies in our, civiliz in our species at this time. We have to bring the feminine back so that there's a healthy balance, the healthy yang and the healthy yin. Now, throughout my adulthood, there has been a wonderful women's movement that has been rediscovering the wisdom of women and the intelligence of women and the ingenuity of women. In fact, it's traveled so far that, so fast, that now 60% of college graduates in America are women. Only 40% are men as of now. And that's, that's unbalanced. The men are falling behind. It's one thing to recover the divine feminine. It's another to marry that divine feminine with the sacred masculine. What if the sacred masculine is toxic? My most recent book was called that, The Hidden Spirituality of Men, Ten Metaphors to Awaken the Sacred Masculine. Because I think that we're now out of balance because I think women have been doing their inner work for decades and men, for the most part, have not. And men have inherited a toxic understanding of masculinity and is contributing to the excess of yang, of the heat, global warming, too much yang energy. We need the healthy balance. There are ways that men can recover, and we have to do it swiftly, the sacred masculine, the healthy masculine. But part of it is throwing off some of the illusory definition of masculinity that our culture has been feeding us for several hundred years. And this is not just an issue for men. Women are 
intimately involved in at least two ways. First of all, there are plenty of men in women's lives, including your sons and grandsons, your fathers and uncles and brothers and co-workers, but also women are Im implicated in this because, if you follow Jung's theory, the feminine soul is half masculine and half feminine, and the masculine soul is the same. So if there is a toxic masculinity floating around in our culture, which I'm absolutely convinced there is, then that means that women too are walking around with toxic masculinity in their soul. So we all have to do some cleaning up. This is the next stage, I believe, in the women's movement, to get passionate about supporting men and critiquing the masculine in our culture and in our own souls. So bringing the healthy yin-yang energy back is a deep part of how we will reinvent Christianity. Remember that Jesus himself, the first name given Jesus in the Christian Bible, the New Testament, of course the first writer is Paul, is Sophia, Lady Wisdom. Wisdom is a lady, wisdom is feminine the world over. And not only that, but today's biblical scholars agree that Jesus himself, the historical Jesus, comes from the wisdom tradition of Israel. And the wisdom tradition is in fact the nature-based mysticism is not a book-based, but a nature-based mysticism of Israel. It's a creation-centered spirituality indeed. This and the prophetic tradition are the roots of the historical Jesus. And so the fact that the Jesus story itself shakes up the whole presumptions and culture about masculinity and femininity is very key to the Jesus story. His first followers were both women and men, and there is considerable evidence that the women were more courageous than the men. They hung around for the darkest times, such as the crucifixion. Furthermore, there is ample evidence that leaders in the early church were women as well as men. Paul names a number of these women. The oldest painting we have in Christianity of, of, um, of, a, of a service, of a liturgy, has a woman at the altar. Now, needs to say they tried to cover that up and scrape it around, around it, but that is, in fact, the oldest um, um, uh, mosaic we have. It includes women uh, as leaders. <clears throat> a third element, and this is all these feed one another, they're not separate, is that we have to return, we have to light a fire under our mystical tradition, our mystical awareness, and our mystical brains. Today's biblical scholarship helps so much in this regard. For example, for example John Dominic Croissant's recent book on Paul, In Search of Paul, he says in that book, he says, Paul is a mystic. He thinks mystically. He theologizes mystically. He lives mystically. And he expects all Christians to live mystically. In fact, Croissant says, for Paul, you cannot be a Christian without being a mystic. Now that's a heck of a mouthful. Why? Because frankly, 99% of seminaries that I know of that call themselves Christian do not turn out mystics. They do not teach mysticism. They don't even know how to. They're so busy proving that they're scientific and getting accredited by accrediting bodies that wouldn't know what mysticism is if it bit them in the bum. They're so busy accomplishing left brain that they don't know how to teach the right brain, which is the mystical brain. And let me give you a concrete example, not from Christianity, but from a Jewish seminary. I know a rabbi who was in the seminary in the 70s, and he raised his hand in class and said, teach us about our mystics, our Jewish mystics. Shut up, the professor said. This is serious theology. He had his big left brain with a PhD flag hanging on it, you see. <laughs> Nothing in his right brain, obviously, because this guy kept pestering him, kept pestering him. Teach us about our Jewish mystics. Teach us about our Jewish mystics. Finally, the guy blew up and said, there is no Jewish mysticism. Well, that shut the seminary up. So much so that he, he plodded through school and got graduated, got ordained, 
Then he went to India to live with Rajneesh for three years to learn something about mysticism. And I think that's a sad but a very funny story that a rabbi had to go to live with Rajneesh because he had a professor who had never heard what? Of Martin Buber or Heschel or the Kabbalah? Now you say, well, that was the 70s. Well, the point is that there's a system. There's an anti-mystical system, and we call it the university. We call it academia. Theodore Rosak says this. He says, the Enlightenment held mysticism up for ridicule as the worst offense against science and reason. Well, we have to redo education, folks. We have to redo education. This is one reason our young people are so bored. This is one reason 72% of black boys are not graduated from high school today. It is because they're mystical. They're creative. They have intuition, and there's no place for it in an infinite amount of passing exams that a computer can grade. And I'm not talking theory, I'm talking practice. I have been working in this pilot program for two years with inner city kids in Oakland, and these kids come alive, and they're full of imagination and creativity and intelligence, but their intelligence is being insulted by what we call education in America today, which is a modern and European form of education. It is not education of the whole person, even the whole brain, and certainly not of all the chakras. A true human education educates all the chakras, not just one half of the brain. It's a scandal. It has to change because nothing else is going to change if our education doesn't change. Education is a funnel through which we pass our politicians, our bankers, our healers, our doctors, our teachers, our ministers and priests. And if that funnel is distorted at this time in history like it is, if it's leaving out six chakras and half the brain, duh! And don't, I'm sick and tired of our being told that our boys have attention deficit disorder because they don't like sitting in a desk for seven hours a day. They're just smart enough to be bored and act it out with their bodies, that's all. We can do so much better than we're doing. I was speaking on this subject quite passionately, I guess, in, in Napa two years ago, and a woman came up afterwards and she said, I'm a teacher, I'm a great teacher, I love teaching, and I'm quitting. And every one of my district who's a good teacher is quitting. Because we agree with you, We're, we do not respond to our vocation as teachers to give an infinite amount of exams to these kids. We're there to bring the wisdom out of the kids, and there's no time for it in today's pressurized, pass the exam, a notion of education. <clears throat> so part of that is yin-yang energy, too. It's, it is. We, we have an educational system that does not bring in the intuition and the mystical side of things, and that is why it is out of balance. You know, Albert Einstein, toward the end of his life, was asked, what regrets do you have? He said, my number one regret is that I, I wish I had studied the mystics earlier in my life. That's a pretty interesting confession, testimony, from a great mind and a great human being on his, on his deathbed, if you will. He wished he'd been exposed earlier to the mystics. I suspect that most graduates of our seminaries could say the same thing. <clears throat> Another dimension to revitalizing Christianity is, of course, meditation. We have to learn to meditate. That's called calming the reptilian brain. Remember, we all have three brains. The oldest brain is uh, 420 million years old, and that's our reptilian brain, so it's, it can be quite dominant. The second brain, half as old, 210 million years old, is our mammal brain. And the third brain, very recent, 100,000, maybe 200,000 years old, is this amazing, um, intellectual, creative brain that gets us in so much trouble, but is also so amazing. Indeed, with that brain, our species has taken over the planet, 
in 100,000 years. No other species comes close. Of course, no other species tried to take over the planet. But here we are. We've taken it over in 100,000 years. We don't know what to do with it. Uh, one thing we have to do is to back up a little. Let's pay attention to this reptilian brain. The reptilian brain is the brain that took us to war in Iraq, the wrong war in the wrong place against the wrong people for the wrong reason. That's a reptilian response. Reptilian brain is action-reaction. And of course, it's not about bonding, it's not about compassion. Uh, reptiles aren't real good at bonding, it's not their thing. <laughs> so the issue is how do we deal with the reptilian brain so that the mammal brain, which is about bonding, mammals are about bonding. The word for compassion in both Hebrew and Arabic comes to the word for womb. So the womb people, that's us, the mammals, we bring a special dimension of kinship and family and bonding and compassion. And that's why every spiritual teacher from every tradition around the world, from the Buddha to the Dalai Lama to Jesus to Isaiah to Muhammad, and all of them preach compassion. Trying to call forth this middle brain, this mammal brain that is that gets swamped when the reptilian brain overtakes us. How do we tame that reptilian brain? Through meditation. Nice crocodile, nice crocodile. That's how you befriend <laughs> your reptilian brain. How do I know that? Because reptiles, while they're not good at bonding, are very good at solitude. They love to lie alone in the sun. Check it out. Check it out. And that's what meditation does. Yet the word monk, you know, comes from the word for solitude, monos. And so there's a monk in all of us. But we have to give it attention. It's just like working out. You have to work out that brain a little bit, that capacity for solitude. The Bible talks about it. In Hosea it says, I will call you out into the wilderness and there speak to you heart to heart. In the wilderness, you see, in silence. This is one reason the man is so attracted to fishing, for example or even hunting, it is. Because they are going into places of silence with some kind of legitimacy, cultural respectability. It's not okay for men to go to a Buddhist temple and meditate, but it's okay for men to go out fishing and meditate. Fine, whatever it takes, do it. You know, we sent astronauts up in the sky. Most of them came back as mystics and a little messed up because they didn't, there were no spiritual directors at NASA to process the mystical experience they had. But I've talked to a couple of them, and they told me that seeing the Earth, this jewel, lit jewel, against the blackness, the darkness of the rest of the cosmos, and the silence that was up there, he said, that made me a mystic, they told me. Well, I figured it out on a nap and what it cost to turn these jet fighter pilots into mystics. It's about $42 million a shot. I figure there has to be a cheaper way of, of um, getting men into their mystical brain and heart. And there is. It's meditation. It doesn't cost anything. So we can so underestimate this, this, this power we have to, well, um, Maria Montessori said, to create silence, to make silence. It is so important, especially at this time when there's so much stress and there's so much noise and so much busyness and there's so much pessimism and fear. All the more reason why the reptilian brain needs attention. And you give it attention through meditation. And we are being gifted today with so many techniques of meditation from so many different traditions, whether it's sun dancing and chanting and sweat lodges from the indigenous peoples or whether it's chanting and breathing and walking meditations from, from the Buddhist peoples and so forth. And we Christians too, we can learn to chant the Bible instead of just think about it and analyze it and fight about it. Take a, a few good lines like, the kingdom of God is within us, the queen of God is among us, and chant those lines, chant them. That puts them in a totally different part of your brain than thinking about them and arguing about them. And that's what we need to entertain that other part of our brain. Then we can recouple the mammal brain, which is our powers for compassion, with our intellectual brain because the reptilian brain will be, will be um, at peace. <clears throat> and then another dimension, of course, to 
are revitalizing Christianity is the whole role, and I've alluded to it quite a bit tonight, of course, what I call deep ecumenism. In other words, our species at this time, and especially in this country of ours, is so exposed now to so many traditions, so many wisdom traditions. It's a glorious smorgasbord that we've never been exposed to before. It's such an opportunity to learn from the wisdom of the Buddhists. I happened two weeks ago to have been with the Dalai Lama for a day when he was in San Jose, California. And it was a powerful experience. And seeing him uh, lecture to, to 11,000 Americans for two hours on a, on a ser one page serious Buddhist text, it was amazing for me just to see 11,000 Americans sit still for two hours to hear something deep around spirituality and, and religion. That alone was, was like a miracle. But um, uh, we are being gifted at this time, uh, as I alluded to earlier, with the, the new scholarship in terms of our own Western tradition, the, what we're learning about just between the historical Jesus and the canonical Jesus, or the Christ, the cosmic Christ, all that is so important. The cosmic Christ tradition is the mystical tradition, and is also from that same wisdom tradition that Jesus, the historical Jesus himself, comes from. And the, the teachings of Jesus are so stunning. If you just had, I really believe this, if we had nothing of his teachings except Matthew 25, where he says, you know, you clothe the naked, you clothe me, you feed the hungry, you feed me, you give water to the thirsty, you give water to me, you visit me, someone in prison, you visit me. That one teaching, my friends, absolutely blows the world up. It turns everything inside out. You're not just you, I'm not just I. We're beyond just our small self with the small s. We are one another. We are one another when we rejoice in one another's joy, and we are one another when we participate in one another's suffering and loss. Just that one teaching, Matthew 25, is a revolution with a capital R. We, have nothing, we who come from the West have nothing to be ashamed of in terms of the depth of the, what the Jewish prophetic tradition teaches and what Jesus coming out of that tradition and the wisdom tradition teach. But we have to go deeper into it. We have to go deeper into it and get beyond the fear stage and the fundamentalist stage and the literalism stage to truly taste the, the depth of the, of the teachings of Jesus. It was Gandhi who said, Gandhi who was a Hindu, not a Christian, said, I learned to say no from the West, i.e. from Jesus. Gandhi learned to say no from Jesus because that is a prophetic no. That is what the prophets do. That part of us says no. And in his tradition, especially at that time of Hinduism, there was this teaching that, oh, don't worry about the untouchables. If they live a decent life, they'll do better, better the next incarnation. And Gandhi said no. He said no to that teaching. Because he learned from Jesus with participation and with a real commitment the courage it takes to live out compassion and justice that we can make things happen this time around for all of us. And that is what helped to give him his strength in taking on the British Empire. And of course, that very tactic of nonviolence is, of course, what gave King his genius and his teaching to take on segregation in, in America. So, being able to learn from other traditions does not mean that you surrender your own. It, in fact, means you can go deeper into your own. Let me give you a concrete story. A few years ago, I got a telephone call from a journalist in Los Angeles, and she said, um, the biggest youth prison in America is here in Los Angeles. And she said, it's been a hellhole. People go in there, these young, young men, and they, there's gangs, and there's murders, and there's rapes, and everything else. Finally, she said they were so desperate that they called three Buddhist monks in to teach them to meditate. And you know what's happened? The whole place has turned around. It's now become a civilized 
place in which to live. Now she said, I'm calling you because I've heard about you, I've read some of your books, and here's my question. Do Christians meditate? Now that's an interesting question. My answer was not as much as they should. We're too busy reading prayers. We're reading prayers. See, we've got our eyes in texts. You know, I, I have nothing against books. Believe me, I've written a few, and I hope someone here reads them. <laughs> but believe me, prayer is not primarily about texts. Prayer is the heart. In a sweat lodge, you take, don't take your favorite prayer book in with you. It's kind of hot and dark in there to do that. You pray from your heart. That's what meditation does. It gets into the heart, and it, and it calms that right, right brain. So that's what she wanted to know. She said 95% of the prisons here are either Baptist or Roman Catholic, which of course means there was a heavy black population and a heavy Latino population in that jail. But she said, why did they have to call in Buddhists to teach these people to meditate? Well, that's a darn good question. And the answer is obvious, because Christians don't meditate. We're too busy reading other people's prayers at each other. And if you don't think that's boring, check out how many people are not in your church on Sunday, and what age groups are no longer represented. That's another thing. We can rejuvenate worship. I've been working on that since the Pope fired me. I became a, an Episcopalian. I'm grateful to the Episcopal Church for religious asylum that they offered me. And, um, but the main reason I did it, and I told the Episcopal Bishop in California this, was to reinvent uh, the liturgy using rave and using these new languages coming from young people. So we dance the Mass instead of sitting in benches being preached at and reading to each other. And believe me, the energy is totally different. All kinds of artists show up, including folk artists who may come on stilts. One lady came with her white cobra one day. I said, oh my, has he been fed lately? <laughs> I said, keep him away from the baby, but you know, that's okay. But, um, it's, it's a different kind of space, and it's a sacred space. It's an ecumenical space, and, um, and, and there's energy to it. It's not just the young who want to dance their prayers. There was an 84-year-old woman out there one night. She said to me, she said, uh, she said, I've been waiting 82 years for someone to connect my love of dance to my love of prayer. She said, finally it's happening. She said, I took three buses to get here tonight. Someone's going to have to drive me home because by the time I'm through, the buses aren't going to be running anymore. So we call this the Cosmic Mass, and um, there are ways to rejuvenate our worship and still carry the traditional along. And then let me close with uh, an observation from a wonderful Christian theologian, Dorothy Sola, um, a German uh, uh, theologian, died a couple years ago. Um, she says that the... Uh, the goal of the Christian religion is not the idolizing of Christ, not Christolatry, but that we all are in Christ, as a mystical expression goes, that we have a part in the life of Christ. The Savior is a wounded healer, and he heals so that we may become as he is. But as he is, laughs as he laughs, weep as he weeps, heal the sick, even those who without knowing it have contracted the great neuroses of our society, who know no mercy within themselves and their children when they consent to the nuclear stake and technologies that are killing the planet and our own souls. And she says that the mystical tradition is the feminist language of Christianity and of religion, and this is one reason it has been banished in so many of our seminaries and so forth, and we must bring the mystical back, she says. And here is her poem. She says, it's called When He Came, about Jesus. He needs you. That's all there is to it. Without you, he's left hanging, goes up in Dachau's smoke. It's sugar and spice in the baker's hands. Gets revalued in the next stock market crash. He's consumed and blown away, used up without you. Help him. That's what faith is. He can't bring it about, his kingdom. Couldn't then, couldn't later, can't now. Not at any rate without you. That is his irresistible appeal. 
When I read this poem, it echoes a wonderful book by Rabbi Heschel, Abraham Heschel, God Needs Man, meaning God needs human beings. That the compassionate agenda of God cannot happen on this planet without human beings. That is exactly what Dorothy Sola is saying in this poem about the Christ. I'm going to read it again. He needs you. That's all there is to it. Without you, he's left hanging, goes up in Dachau's smoke, is sugar and spice in the baker's hands, gets revalued to the next stock market crash. He's consumed and blown away, used up without you. Help him. That's what faith is. He can't bring it about his kingdom. Couldn't then, couldn't later, can't now. Not at any rate without you. And that is his irresistible appeal. To the college students here, especially the young ones, I really do hope that you will sense the adventure and the daring and the courage of this moment of planetary history, of human history, yes, and of Christian history. We have to push that restart button on our species itself, on education, on politics and economics, on the media, and certainly on religion. And while we elders are here to hopefully support and guide and cheer you on, this is really your generation's vocation. It is your generation's call. It is a huge call to reinvent Christianity for a third millennium. May God bless you in all your efforts. Amen.